You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. It is April, and it is time to dig into God's Word in the April issue of The Lutheran Witness as we look at searching the scriptures in just a moment. Thanks to Concordia University, Wisconsin for supporting The Coffee Hour. Find out more about Concordia University, Wisconsin at cuw.edu. Live Uncommon. Joining us this morning, the Reverend Roy Askins, Managing Editor of The Lutheran Witness. Pastor Askins, welcome back. Thank you. Good to be back again. It is good to get to study God's Word with you. This month, we are in Searching the Scriptures, page, I believe, page 28 in the April issue. Should be in your mailbox by now, hopefully. Yeah, uh, yeah. Look so. for a, a wonderful stained glass with some random dude's hand. He's not random at all once you look at the inside cover. <laughs> Some some <laughs> random dude's hand holding up the uh, LCMS Constitution. It was actually a beautiful stained glass from St. Lorenz in Frankenmuth, Michigan. Uh-huh. So, uh, really cool story, but you're going to have to read more on the issue to learn about it. I so. love this <laughs> issue. It's like all the history nerd stuff about the Synod, and it's wonderful. Yes. I love it. You'll notice I wrote quite a bit of it because I also happen to be a history nerd, yes. and it was a lot of fun. History nerds unite. Yes. <laughs> So, in Searching the Scriptures this month, the title is Reconciled in Christ. So, any insights you'd like to give us before we dig into the text? Yeah, sure. So, this is kind of uh, really getting to the meat uh, of what St. Paul is saying. And we have gone through the first part of Ephesians chapter 2, where he's talking about you've been saved by grace through faith. And now we're going to get into the meat of this, which is that Jews and Gentiles are now reconciled in Christ Jesus. They have first been reconciled uh, to God by grace for Christ's sake, through faith. And now they are also, as a consequence of that, reconciled to one another. And the point here is that if we want to draw together, we do so by drawing closer to our Lord Jesus Christ, closer to God. And this is going to be then the discussion of this whole section. How are we one in Christ? All right, shall we dig in? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, question one. Ephesians, read Ephesians 2, verses 11 to 12. What role did circumcision play in the Old Testament? See also Genesis 17, 1 through 14. And then read Galatians 5, verses 2 through 6. What confusion had risen over the rite of circumcision? And how does St. Paul address this confusion for the Ephesians? So let's uh, start with Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 12. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope of God in the world. So what role did uh, circumcision play in the Old Testament? See also Genesis chapter 17. We'll get there in just a minute. Uh, circumcision was that which marked a distinction between the Jew and the Gentile. As St. Paul mentions, the Jews called Gentiles the uncircumcised. And the consequence of this is it was uh, by lack of this mark, by not having this mark, it, it pointed out that the Gentiles were, as St. Paul says, separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. In other words, aliens to it. They did not belong to it. They were strangers to the covenants of promise. And the consequence of all these things, the consequence of not having this mark of belonging, of not being part of the people of God, is that they were with uh, having no hope and without God. This is their circumstance. And this kind of actually brings us all the way back, in some sense, to the beginning of Ephesians to you too, right? As for you, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. So the rite of circumcision at this time, in particular in Ephesians, when St. Paul's reading, reading, writing to the Ephesians, this was marking the Gentiles as, I shouldn't say, uh, the, prior to this, prior to Christ's read, the coming, it marked the Gentiles as those who do not belong to the promise. Now, we see in Genesis chapter one, uh, 17, verses 1 through 14, that the covenant of circumcision had other purposes as well. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm going to give you a quick summary. Abram at the time is 99 years old. Let that sink in for just a minute. Abram is 99 years old, and God comes to him and says, I'm going to make a covenant with you. And the covenant is that uh, your offspring will be, be an everlasting covenant with your offspring. Okay. And the mark of this offspring is that you shall be circumcised, right? And the flesh of your foreskins. And anybody who belongs to Israel, whether you bring a male into your house, everyone who belongs to Israel will be circumcised. And the one who is not circumcised will be cut off from his people. So this rite of circumcision, or this practice of circumcision, I should say, the Jews as belonging to God, uh, the descendants of Abraham as belonging to God for a particular purpose. And this particular purpose is specifically connected to that which is circumcised, right? The whole point of this act of circumcision is to 
uh, bring forth then the promised Messiah, to mark them as those who will be the ones through whom the promised Messiah will come, the one who will be the redemption, not simply of Israel, but as St. Paul is going to argue in Ephesians, the redemption of Jew and Gentile alike. So the, the problem that had arisen then in the early church was, do, Christ, uh, do Gentiles when they come into the household of God, must they also be circumcised? And this is really the whole argument behind the book of Galatians, the letter, uh, Paul's letter to the Galatians. And Paul basically says, look, if you are going to require circumcision, this is a commandment of the law. And if this is the case, then he says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 2, Christ will be no, uh, of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ you who would be justified by the law. So if you're going to say requirements of the law, you must be circumcised in order to be um, a Christian, in order to be belonging to the descendants of Abraham, then you are bound not simply to circumcision, but the whole law entirely. And then this means Christ is of no value to you. So then he goes on and points out in verse 6 of Galatians 5, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. So once again, the point being, in Christ, God has, and as we're going to see again in, in this section in Ephesians, in Christ, all of this has been reconciled, and he has redeemed us by grace for Christ's sake through faith. That was a lot. It, but very helpful, very insightful. Anything else on question number one? No, I think we're good. All right, let's go on to question two then, as we continue in Ephesians chapter two. Read Ephesians 2 verse 13. Why were the Gentiles once far off? Read Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 49, and 29, verse 22, and Isaiah 49, verses 1 and 12. Who are those from far away in these texts? All right, so Ephesians 2, verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So, but now in Christ Jesus. So who is St. Paul talking here? He is writing this letter to those in Ephesus, both Jews and Gentiles alike. And so when he says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were far off, he's referring then to the Gentiles, those who were <clears throat> not originally belonging to this promise. Once again, this is a, a parallel also again to Ephesians. As for you, you were dead in your trespasses and sins, right? They were once again, far off, not members of the promise. Now, contrast that, those who are far off then, let's think about you know, what does this mean then for those who are far off? Why were they far off? Contrast those that with those who are near. And specifically, we're talking here probably about the temple, those who are near the temple uh, in which Israel maintains the holy things of God. Think about this for a minute. In this temple, you have these holy things set apart for service to God, and there was a wall, and we're going to talk about this wall here more in a, in a minute. There was a wall that separated the Gentiles. They literally couldn't draw near to the holy things of God because they were Gentiles, and to cross this border, this wall, meant death. They crossed it. They did so on the pain of death. So they were far off from the holy things of God. In contrast now, in Christ Jesus, I should say, they are brought near by his blood, right? The, the, the Israelites, the priests at the time, they could only draw near, even they could only draw near to the holy things of God by virtue of being sprinkled with the blood of bulls and goats, right? They had to be purified themselves. Now in the blood of Christ, he brings near not simply the Old Testament priests and not simply the people of Israel, but Jew and Gentile alike are now by his blood brought near. Now, this language of uh, once far off refers to groups of people in the Old Testament, and they have different, different roles. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 49, and then also in verse 22, but we're, we're going to focus on verse 49, the Lord talks about a group that is far off and how he uses this group of people actually to punish Israel. So 28, verse 49 of Deuteronomy, the Lord will bring a nation against you from far away from the end of the earth, swooping down like an eagle, a nation whose language you do not understand. And then it goes on and talks about how this nation will punish Israel. So this portion of Deuteronomy, Moses is giving warnings to the people of Israel about what will happen if they refuse to remain faithful to the covenant that God has made from them, or made with them. And those who are far off, four nations will come and destroy Israel. And this is a common theme throughout the prophets. You see it in Ezekiel, you'll see it in all sorts of places. These foreign nations, they are far off. So they are, uh, those who are far off are, in this sense, objects of God's or tools God uses to punish Israel. But those who are far off also receive promises in the Old Testament as well. So if we look at Isaiah chapter 49, verse 1, the suffering servant says, 
Listen to me, O coastlands, and give attention, you peoples from afar. The Lord called me from the womb, and from the body of my mother he named my name. And he goes on and talks about how the God, how God prepared him to serve to serve his people. Once again, those peoples from afar also belong to this promise of the suffering servant. As we're coming into to Lent here, I'm, I'm imagining this is probably going to go live pretty close to Holy Week, right? We're going to hear these readings of the suffering servant over and over again. We know this is Christ. So not only are these people in the Old Testament who are far off tools God uses to punish Israel, but they are also the ones to whom he speaks the promise that they will be incorporated uh, into this household of God by virtue of this suffering servant who dies for the, the world. So those who are far off then means both those who are spiritually far off, but then also physically far off and then brought together in Christ Jesus. All right. Question three. I think we can do it. Okay. <laughs> Read Ephesians 2, verse 14. What peace does Christ bring? What is the dividing wall of hostility, and what does it have to do with the flesh of Christ? Ephesians 2, verse 14. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. And then I'm going to continue into verse 15 a little bit. By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one man, new man in place of the two. Okay, so that kind of gives us a little bit of context for uh, the, the beginning here, verse 14. For he himself is our peace. He is speaking, of course, of Christ. Christ is our peace. And Christ makes us both one, right? Us both one, that is both Jews and Gentiles made one in Jesus Christ. So how does this work? Well, as we discussed uh, last month, and as we see in the first half of Ephesians chapter 2, Christ is our peace with God. This is the essential problem we have as sinful human beings. It is the hostility between us and God. As a consequence of our sins, we are dead. Elsewhere, St. Paul uses the language of enemies. We are enemies of God as a consequence of our sinful flesh. And, and this separation from God needs to be healed. And this separation from God is reconciled in Christ Jesus, who is both God and man. This is absolutely important. In fact, this is the, the, the point. You see these parallels between he has made us both one. He himself is both God and man, uh, the two natures uh, in the one person of Jesus Christ, which remains even after the ascension. You know, he doesn't leave his humanity behind. He's, he remains both God and man. And in the, his person, the person of Jesus Christ, he therefore reconciles us who are, he reconciles humankind to God the Father, right? In himself, he reconciles us to God by his suffering and death, okay? Okay. So by virtue of that, he also then uh, talks about here, destroys the dividing wall of hostility, has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. So what is this dividing wall of hostility? Well, there's a couple of different meanings that that can be given to this this wall of hostility. I think most likely it refers to, once again, as we talked about earlier, that wall on the temple grounds, I believe it's called the Soreg that separates the Gentiles or prevents the Gentiles from entering into the temple itself, the temple proper. And there were signs on the wall that if the Jews crossed this or the Gentiles crossed this wall, they did so on the pain of death. That wall, that physical wall, is also a metaphorical representation of the separation between Jew and Gentile, right? In Christ, that wall is brought down. These two, Jew and Gentile, are now united in Christ Jesus. And th this is, of course, the secondary meaning of Christ's uh, peace that he brings. But it's also, and I think here, St. Paul's primary point as he's dealing with this division between the struggle between Jews and Gentiles in, in Ephesus, this is the primary point he's making here. You two now belong together, Jew and Gentile alike, belong together in Christ, in the body of Christ, in the church. So you are no longer separated, but brought together. We are searching the scriptures with the Reverend Roy Askins, managing editor of The Lutheran Witness. We're in the April issue of The Lutheran Witness. We'll continue the conversation in just a moment right here on The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. At Concordia University, Wisconsin, we believe you were created for a reason to use your God-given gifts to help others, to live a life of self-sacrifice in a me-first world, to live a life that's uncommon. Whether you're taking one of 50-plus online programs or learning with us in person on the shores of Lake Michigan, you'll be equipped to make an uncommon impact. Learn more at cuw.edu 
Concordia University, Wisconsin. Live Uncommon. Welcome back to the Coffee Hour. I'm Eddie Bates. I'm Sarah Eggleseth. It is April. We're taking a look at searching the scriptures in the April issue of the Lutheran Witness with the Reverend Roy Askins. He's managing editor of the Lutheran, Wit- Lutheran Witness. We are in our theme this this month is Reconciled in Christ, page 28, if you've got your paper copy, your print copy of the Lutheran Witness right there in front of you. We're in Ephesians chapter 2, so we've gone through cre- questions 1 through 3. Anything else about question 3 before we go on to question 4? I think we need to keep moving, otherwise right. I'm not going to get through all of these. <laughs> all right, read Ephesians chapter 2, verse 15. 15, what does St. Paul have in mind when he says, law of commandments expressed in ordinances, and what is the consequence of four sinners of Christ's atoning work? All right. So we were just in 14, right? Bringing down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility, and then 15, by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in, in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. So that's once again 15 and and 16. I'm going to start here and and mention that in the when the ESV translates this ab- abolishing. They don't have it in mind the sense of destroying or completely getting rid of, but more in the sense of nullifying the law of commandments. The 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 law it, Christ does do away with the Old Testament and the Old Testament law. He in fact fulfills this Old Testament law so that by fulfilling it. Uh, we no longer have to, right? It is thus full. It is fulfilled in his life, suffering, and death. He did not leave one bit of it incomplete, and now he gives to us that same his fulfillment that it belongs that becomes ours, right? He underwent circumcision on the eighth day. He lived under the Old Testament law so that he might give that his perfect fulfillment to us, right? So it, we might say he, he, in his flesh, brought down the dividing wall of hostility by nullifying the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, right? Notice we have like three law words here, the law of commandments expressed in ordinances. You look at the Greek, it just has three law words all kind of crammed together, right? You're not really sure what, he's just basically saying the whole scope of it, everything is completed, that he might uh, fulfilled, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two. Once again, note the the ongoing metaphor of two being united into one, right? He creates in himself one new man in place of the two. So you have uh, the the, uh, the divine nature and the human nature united in him. You have the Jew and the Gentile united in him, right? All of these things that w- were once separated uh, by virtue of sin and, and rebellion are now united in him. And in so doing, he brings he brings peace. Now, what are the consequences of Christ's atoning work? Or well, that right there, he brings uh, peace and reconciliation. So the reconciliation first begins, as we've said already, uh, with God, and therefore also then we have peace and reconciliation with the neighbor. There is no longer any need for hostility because in his one body in the cross, he killed the hostility, all the hostility between uh, man and God. But then also as a consequence of that between uh, each other. So no longer is there hostility between the Jew and the Gentile. I think we can go ahead and continue on to the next one, I think. Okay. Yeah, I think so. All right. Oh, no. Oop. Sorry, we're not. Throw something else. <laughs> I apologize. Okay. Uh, the point here also that we need to make is this unity only comes in and through Jesus Christ. I hinted at this at the beginning. We do not create unity by drawing closer to one another. Unity happens actually as we draw closer to God by creed and confession. As we draw closer to God, uh, as all Christians draw closer to God by creed and confession, we will also then naturally draw closer to one another. But that's the fundamental move. If we're looking for unity and, and cooperation and fellowship with our fellow believers in Christ Jesus, we do not do this by creating false unities with people around us, but actually drawing closer to God in creed and confession and our understanding of the Word of God and His teaching. As we all do that, we will also then naturally draw closer together, but it is only built around uh, drawing closer to God in the confession of His Word, uh, in, that is to say, Jesus Christ Himself. All right, question five. I think we're good now. Okay. We can do this now. Okay. Read Ephesians 2, verses 17 to 18. When did Christ preach? How can St. Paul tell the Ephesians that Christ preached peace to those who were near and to those who were far off? In verse 18, St. Paul says, We both. To whom is he referring? 
Ephesians chapter 2, 17 and 18. And he came and preached peace to you who are far off and peace to those who are near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Okay, so who, when did Christ preach? Well, this is uh, an easy one. We actually have Christ preaching in two circumstances during his earthly ministry, and then even after his resurrection, we have Christ physically preaching. So, you know, all throughout his earthly ministry, he's preaching. Luke chapter four, Jesus goes to Nazareth. What does he do? He reads from the scroll in the synagogue, and then he sits down to teach. I actually kind of like that. I think we should bring that back. Pastors should sit down to teach. That's how they used to do it back in the good old days. But anyways, he sits down to teach, right? In Matthew chapter four, uh, Jesus goes throughout all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogue. So throughout his earthly ministry, he's constantly preaching preaching and teaching. He also preaches after his resurrection as well. He does this in Mark chapter 16, verses 14 to 18. He preaches to the disciples. He also preaches to them in Acts chapter 1. So we see him continuing this preaching. But then, and this is how he can say that Christ, uh, St. Paul can say that Christ preached the Ephesians. He then sends out his apostles, of which Paul is one, to preach his word. And the preaching of the apostles, as he tells them, is his own preaching. That is the preaching of Jesus Christ. That is to reject the apostles is also to reject Christ. That would be the opposite corollary. So by virtue of hearing the proclamation of God's word, by virtue of hearing the the preaching of the apostles, the Ephesians have also heard the preaching of Jesus Christ himself. Now, we both, as a reference once again to Paul uh, and the Jews, and then the Greeks and the Gentiles. So Paul, the the Jews and the Gentiles, uh, the Greeks and the Gentiles, we both, whether Jew or Gentile, have access to the Father through the Spirit. We can keep going. Question six. Let's do it. Read Ephesians chapter two, verses 19 and 20. To what does the foundation of the apostles and prophets refer? Why is Jesus the cornerstone of this foundation? So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. So this whole section begins with St. Paul pointing out that because they were the uncircumcised, they were alienated from Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise. Well, he's bringing that back around now and saying, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens of the household of God, fellow citizens with the Jews of the household of God. And how, where does this take place? Well, this takes place as it is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Now, apostles and prophets is a reference to the Old and New Testaments. Uh, St. Paul is writing probably in the late 50s, AD 59 to 61 or so. He's writing this letter to the Ephesians. At this time, it's entirely likely that we have two to three of the Gospels already written. Matthew, Mark, and Luke were written early. It's entirely possible they were written before 59. And so it's entirely possible that they already have these documents in hand. And so as he's talking about this, the apostles and the prophets, he's saying you have the scriptures, right? The preaching of the or the prophets of the Old Testament, the apostles of the New Testament. These scriptures, this word of God is the foundation of the house. And of this word of God, Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. So he is the cornerstone in the sense that both Old and New Testament uh, point to him and to his work that he has done for the world. Uh, We see this in two passages. If you look at Luke chapter 24, verses 25 to 27, Jesus is speaking with the disciples on the road to Emmaus, and it says, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. That is to say, the Old Testament and everything that it says and does is bringing us, it's like a, you could think of like a huge funnel. The entire Old Testament is funneling us down to the cross, to Jesus Christ, to his suffering and death, his crucifixion. That is the whole purpose and intention of the Old Testament. And that is also the case with the New Testament. We have in John chapter 20, John is writing in his book and he says, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in the book, in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John is likely the last gospel uh, to be written, and uh, he is saying the same thing. All of these gospels, this the entire New Testament is now given to you to point you to Jesus Christ, and that by believing in him as the Son of God, you would have life in his name. So Jesus himself is the cornerstone of both of these, and this foundation that grows out, the foundation that grows out of this cornerstone is then the Old Testament and the New Testament, the scriptures, and then the church of God is being built upon this foundation. All right, last question. Let's do it. Read Ephesians 2, verse 22. How is the church a dwelling place for God? 
in him, that is, in Jesus Christ, you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So we have a lot of baptismal language here, The in particular, the in him. So when Paul is talking about being in him, in Jesus Christ, this is the baptismal language. You are wrapped in his robe of righteousness that is given to you in baptism. You uh, put on Christ Jesus. So in all these things, you are uh, being built up in him. This language of building is a common metaphor all throughout the book of Ephesians. We're going to get it, especially in Ephesians chapter four, that the church is being built up as a creation of God, the entire universal church. And the point here is not necessarily numerical growth, but rather being built uh, by the spirit through the means of the word of God, growing up into the head who is Christ Jesus. And this is the point that he's going to make in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15. Now, this place, this dwelling place of God, is a place where both Jew and Gentiles are built together as a place where God abides in their midst and works in and among them through his means of grace, his word and sacraments. Anything else you want to share as we wrap up our study today? Yeah. Yeah. As I said earlier, Ephesians chapter 2 kind of gets to the heart of what St. Paul is teaching the Ephesians. Once again, that Jew and Gentile are united in Christ Jesus by virtue, first off, not of being united to one another, but by virtue of being united to the Father through Jesus Christ. And by virtue of drawing near to the Father through Jesus Christ, they're then also brought together as members of the household of God, members in this temple. Now, the next two chapters, chapters three and four, will continue to elaborate on what this unity looks like and how it is lived out. And that's kind of the theme we're going to work through, walking together through the rest of Ephesians. Very good. Reconciled in Christ is the Searching the Scriptures for the April issue of The Lutheran Witness. <clears throat> Pastor, how can we find The Lutheran Witness? If you don't have a subscription, you need to go to cph.org slash witness, and you can subscribe there. If you want to read additional content and other stuff that we don't have in the print magazine, and there's a lot of it, mm-hmm. visit witness.lcms.org. Very good. Very good. Our guest today, the Reverend Roy Askins, Managing Editor of The Lutheran Witness. Thanks so much for joining us on The Coffee Hour. Thank you. Great to be here. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Gopa. The Coffee Hour with Andy and Sarah is a production of KFUO. To support The Coffee Hour and KFUO Radio, visit KFUO.org. You can also text KFUO to 41444 or send an email to gifts at KFUO.org. And you can call us at 800-844-0524. KFUO. Christ for you. Anytime. Anywhere. Anywhere.